Welcome back to another episode of WVU Extension Today on West Virginia Public Broadcasting and YouTube. I'm your host, Zach Harold. Did you know that the West Virginia Fire Service has been around in some capacity since 1931? Well, WVU Extension Fire Service Director Mark Lambert is here to talk to us about the history of the Academy, some of the trainings that the service provides in and outside of West Virginia, Junior Firefighter Camp, and more. Let's check it out. As director of the Fire Academy, um, I'm in charge of uh, fire training for the state of West Virginia. We answer to the State Fire Commission who it and the legislature decide what training is required for you to be a firefighter in this state. So they set the training and then we teach the classes and certify the firefighters for that training. Now, we have the Academy in Weston uh, that's been there since 2007. I have been told, and from what I've read so far, we're the first State Fire Academy. We were, now not the Academy we were now, the one when it was in Morgantown. And we've been around in some form since 1913. We offer what's called Pro Board. Pro Board is a, uh, is a national organization that guarantees a certain level of training. So if you have, let's say, Firefighter One and it's Pro Board from Kentucky, and you come to West Virginia, you don't have to take Firefighter One again because they know because of your Pro Board that you have met the national standard. So providing that allows us to people from out of, or to go out of state and still be able to be firemen and people to come to this state that have had previous training and be firemen. We do a lot of training with mobile props so we can go to the fire departments because obviously West Virginia is really rural and really small fire departments and they obviously can't afford to take all their firemen and come to the academy so it's better if we can take that programming to them and do it right there when they can have all the fire departments from their county or multiple counties come and train together. We have what's called the mobile fire trainers. We have two of those. They can mimic a house fire. Uh, they can even mimic a two-story house fire fueled by propane and um, non-toxic smoke. That way, if somebody has a problem, especially new firefighters sometimes, whether it's a problem with the regulator or they panic or whatever, the instructors that are inside can hit a button and everything ceases and the smoke evacuates immediately within 30 seconds, I think it is. So it's a clean burn and we don't have to worry about their gear being contaminated after they come out. The ARFF, which is our aircraft rescue firefighting simulator, which is basically a plane with one wing that says West Virginia University on it. We are able to simulate cockpit fire, cabin fire, wing fire, landing gear fire. And our guy that's in charge of that, Ralph McNamara, is a 25 year veteran of the Air Force firefighting. Um, him and another guy together, they've got about 60 years, I think, experience. So they've got a lot of training on all types of aircraft, not just that one. But um, every commercial airport in West Virginia is required to have at least a refresher training every year. There are actually seven airports in West Virginia that are considered commercial. And then we get contracted to go out of state sometimes. Um, Penn State, the airport there in Happy Valley, um, Kentucky, some of the military bases. We do industrial firefighting training. Uh, a lot of the oil and gas manufacturers, some of the industrial companies on the Ohio River um, up along the river there. We do a lot of their training. We do for them, we do industrial firefighting, but we also do confined space rescue, which they need those big industrial plants. And we also do military training. For military training, we've gone as far as Hawaii to train for hazardous materials. And they've been to outside of Seattle, Arizona, Texas, uh, you name it. Um, we've been to a military base. It's it's very important for us have for us to have those contacts and that impact outside the state. We actually have just started last fall a program in Mineral County at their career in tech where they're going to teach them firefighter one and two. We have an instructor that's going to teach um, high school kids firefighter one and two. We've talked about it in some other counties but it hasn't happened yet but uh, I'm hoping that we're going to see more opportunities to do that in the future. 
The other firefighter training we do, obviously we train mainly volunteers, because West Virginia is about a, I think it's 92% of the firefighters in this state are volunteers. If you have a fire or you're in a car wreck, whether it's rural West Virginia or rural Kansas or wherever, you probably, it's probably gonna be a volunteer fire department show up. There's a lack of volunteering overall. So um, it seems we're having a hard time recruiting and retaining younger people to do this. My predecessor, Murray Laughlin, and the State Fire Commission and the State Fire Marshal at the time, starting Lewis, came up with the idea for Junior Firefighter Camp, the Junior Fire Camp, as a way to try to get young people interested in being firefighters and to go back to their communities and be able to help. The first one was in 2007, and except for two years at COVID 2020 and 2021, we've had it every year down in West and at the State Fire Academy, five nights, six days. They stay over Jackson's Meal, the 4-H camp in the cabins. And then every day they're over at the Fire Academy. We put them through every facet of fire and rescue training we can, or at least expose them to as much as we can. If they absolutely say no, then we don't make them. We don't make them go in the smoke if they don't, or the fire, or whatever they don't want to do. And we tell them that up front. We like them to push their comfort zone, but we don't make them do anything they don't want to do. We're able to get them first aid CPR certifications, but it also gives them a taste to see whether that's something they want to do as a volunteer or something they want to make a career out of. We've got a number of firemen that have went on to be uh, professional firefighters here in West Virginia and other places. All of our instructors, nobody's paid. We've got instructors from about four or five states that come. All of these people are experts. A lot of them have been in the fire service for years. Some of them have are subject matter experts in auto extrication or hazardous materials or just firefighting or ladder trucks or whatever. All the kids are broken into groups, units, ladder company, truck company. They they're groups of uh, five or six kids. Each day, a different kid's in charge of the group. So everybody gets a leadership experience. They're accountable for all of their people. Everybody has a buddy, you don't go anywhere alone. They do what's called a par count, and when they do that, we, we want to know where every kid is. If somebody's missing, that the leader of the day better know where that kid is. So they learn about responsibility and accountability, and the instructors hold them to that. Now, it's not like basic training in the military or anything. They're not screaming at them, uh, you know. They work with them, teach them, learn. Most of the instructors are like me and would have gave anything when they were that age to have had that kind of camp to go to. Three-fourths of the kids that come are on a fire department or have some affiliation. Their parent is or something. But there's another quarter that that come because they it looks interesting. They want to see if it's what they want to do. You know, uh, not only do we have students coming back, but we get kids from all over the U.S. We've had them from Arizona, Texas, Louisiana, Puerto Rico, New Jersey, Brooklyn, New York, Rhode Island, and everywhere in between. First year I was there, we had a young lady who was in her third year. She came back her third and her fourth year. She was from Colorado. About a fourth of the campers every year are uh, female, and we've got um, female instructors. Uh, we've got career female firefighters. So these young ladies are able to see that if that's something they're really interested in, they want to make a career of it's possible. I think the young lady from Colorado is uh, either going to or is in med school. One night we bring in fire police, EMS, the uh, heli health net helicopter comes in. They can see different groups that they could make careers out of. The guys that come before me as directors, I'm just standing on their shoulders and just trying to keep it to that level and make it better than uh, what it was and keep that fire academy being nationally known. The first statewide fire School we had was in 1931, so that's more of our 100 year we're looking forward to. But uh, I hope we're around doing good things 100 years from now. TimberSafe is a logging safety management program aimed at reducing hazards on the worksite 
and enhancing safety and health management systems. We caught up with our own Pat Donnelly on an active logging site to learn more about the program. Let's check it out. My name is Pat Donnelly. I work for WVU Safety and Health Extension. I'm a field researcher for the Timber Safe Network program. And here we are today at an active logging job here in West Virginia. And we're invited out here by Sisler Construction and Logging to talk about the program. Timber Safe is a research project to try to reduce accidents and fatalities on logging jobs around the state of West Virginia. It's, it's grant funded. Part of the network would be West Virginia University Extension. Um, Mark Fullen, who heads up Safety and Health Extension, as well as uh, Wayne Lundstrom, who works with the Safety and Health also. In the beginning, it was called the Timber Safe Program. We've had 30, we had 31 companies that we dealt with. Every six weeks, we did an audit. They got to know me very well. So yeah, we would talk about their safety management program. We would talk about things that they have changed. And um, they, they will show me things that they have changed, where they've increased their safety program or bringing their safety program up to a, a better level. And there's places where they haven't, but they've been honest about it. And um, we, we have given them the ability through our program to help them through the next steps and what they need to do. It usually starts at a BMP meeting, meaning a best management practice meeting that the Department of Forestry puts on. In order to be a licensed logger, a certified logger in the state of West Virginia, you have to go through a course. One of them is the BMP course, one of them is to have certified first aid, and one of them is to have a chainsaw cutting course. So part of that is I come to those meetings, I offer out Timber Safe as a voluntary service, they sign up for it, they invite me out to their job, and I come out and I start the process of doing a safety audit. I physically look at everything going on in the job. I look for if they're using their seatbelts, do they have an active safety program, a safety management program? Are they, do they have fully charged fire extinguishers? Are they filling up, are they cutting their trees correctly, meaning by the OSHA standard? Are they doing things that would keep them compliant? You know, are they wearing their hard hats when they're out of their machines? Are they wearing the proper PPE when they perform their jobs? Usually when somebody shows up in a white state vehicle on a log job, everybody tenses up. I have to gain their trust. And the trust factor comes in very, very quickly. If they don't trust me, they're not gonna open up. If they don't trust me, they're not gonna to listen to anything that's been brought forth by this program. And once they get to know me, know that I'm not doing anything to hurt them, it's, it's become pretty good. They've welcomed me, and they've actually, through this program, or through the research we've shown through this program, there's been a difference. There's been a difference in safety, there's been a difference in the amount of accidents, there's been accidents, I believe, that have been prevented by it, because they've changed the way they do some things. It's a culture. So we have, we've been able to change that culture. And we, as we go forward with this program, we're hoping that it just changes more and more. In the day-to-day -day grind, sometimes you get uh, lazy or complacent, You're trying to get as many loads out as possible. I think the Timber Safe program has definitely changed, uh, you know, just kind of how we approach things on the job as far as keeping an eye out for one another, keeping machines, you know, up to date as far as fixing leaks or mechanical problems sooner. So just to, just to try to remind each other to take a little bit of time and uh, keep an eye out for any you know, dangerous uh, instances, even if it's just taking the time to, to talk about what happened and you know, how that could potentially happen here. You know, progress with, the, with this group is not quick, but there has been progress, forward progress. And I'm very happy with that fact. And it's shown, it's, it's, it's shown that this, as this program comes into fruition, there's differences and there's tangible differences because we see it through the research. If it would be boiled all down to it, the trust they have in the Timber Safe program has been amazing because they're willing to listen, they're willing to work with, with us, and they're willing to welcome us on our job site. My hope is for more people taking care of the resource that we've been gifted with and being able to do it in a safe manner. So if somebody's gonna hand cut, they're automatically putting on their chaps or their saw pants. They already have their chainsaw boots on. They already have their, their high vis and their, their logger's helmet on. Just doing it as a natural progression, not like, oh my gosh, I forgot that and I gotta go back to the truck and get it. Not that kind of thing, but that they naturally do it because they've been involved in this program and they've seen the benefits of it and they want to push that forward to new employees and to seasoned ones who haven't been part of it before. I'm just part of, the, I'm just part of the, this Timber Safe Network. And I'm, I'm just a field guy. And there's a lot of people working in the office trying to make all this work in, uh, in the respect of having all the paperwork ready, having the binders ready, taking, you know, taking this data and doing with the data what they need to do, analyzing it, putting out reports, and showing people that there is a positive effect being involved in the Timber Safe Network. We realize you can take this, you can take this information and do with it what you want to be compliant, 
my the only thing like I said I, I will add to that is I hope you take this information seriously because it could make the difference between everybody going home the way they showed up at work and having that unenviable task to call a loved one and say hey you need to meet me at the hospital because I never want that that is my whole goal here is that never happens again that's what we do with Timber Safe we want to make people healthy we want to let them go home the way they they came to work that morning in one piece uninjured ready to go the next day in 2023, the WVU Extension Safety and Health Extension received the OSHA Susan Harwood Training Grant to provide hazard recognition and abatement training to 350 workers in the oil and natural gas industry. We joined Tiffany Rice during one of those trainings to learn more. Extension is uniquely positioned to develop, deliver, and evaluate effective training programs such as job safety analysis, hand and finger injuries for oil and gas workers, hydrogen sulfide, um, and then ultimately our, our Safe Land USA program was originally developed from hazard recognition programs through the OSHA Susan Harwood grant. I reached out to Tiffany at the beginning of the year, asked if she had a training or could design a training to uh, help us battle complacency in the workforce. And uh, we came up with this and uh, we took some of our own photos, some of our own incidents, and embedded them into the training that Tiffany already had built and prepared. And then we sat down with Tiffany, myself, our director of EHS, our VP of EHS, my counterpart in West Virginia came up, um, and then we had uh, uh, some of our field staff set in as well and go through the, this, this curriculum slide by slide and kind of add in some newer updated photos, um, some, some incidents that we were seeing. This year, we really wanted to focus on hazard recognition and abatement. We're gonna look at hazards in the gas industry. How can we better fix those hazards, look for those hazards, and then also to fight complacency on the job site. We do lots of hands-on activities uh, throughout the day. Their feedback and involvement during that training is crucial. And so getting them involved, getting them talking about some hard subjects, you know, such as complacency in the workplace. You know, our, is our mind focused on those things uh, throughout the day? Our industry is one that is never ending and it's 24 hours a day and just lots of movement, lots of traffic, lots of hazards. So getting the workers talking about those hazards, talking about not only the work that they do, but outside of that, perhaps how their work life is, is affecting the complacency and some of the evaluations that we're seeing um, from the workers who have attended the training already are things like, this training has helped me do a better job hazard analysis. You know, I am now going to pass this along to others on my crew uh, and talk about ways that we can better fight complacency and do better hazard analysis as we go throughout our day. Our mission with Extension is to improve the lives and livelihoods of West Virginians. And for us, it's, it goes beyond that. It goes to the entire gas and oil industry. And so our ability to then work with, collaborate with companies like EQT, companies that we've worked with in the past. Having those industry opportunities for them to tell us, this is what we're dealing with, this is what we need from the university. And then from, for us to be able to turn that around, work on curriculum, and then ultimately go out and train workers who need the training, who are perhaps hard to reach and don't get as much training, um, is just a great effort on all parts. I'll be honest. Have you ever found yourself borrowing batteries from the smoke detector to stick in the TV remote? Or using a small space heater to keep you warm on these chilly winter nights? Well, Mark Lambert is back to talk about these topics and other fire safety concerns around the house. We try to put out things depending upon the season on cooking fires and holiday, you know, when trees are up and there's more candles out. Um, so you can look on our website. You'd be surprised at the number of people that the smoke detector doesn't work or they take the batteries out of it because it's beeping or they take the batteries out to put in something else and don't put them back and then sadly there's a fire and they don't get out or just don't have smoke detectors. You can get a smoke detector now for as cheap as six bucks, 10 bucks. So there's that, there's radiant space heaters. Now the science on those is getting better and better and, and a lot of them are smarter nowadays, but I would never sleep with one on and I would never leave a room unattended with one on, especially with small kids and animals. It's so easy to knock one over 
it, uh, throw a blanket against it or whatever. And a lot of times, the other big thing people will do is they will daisy chain them with like extension cords. And if the extension cord is not the right gauge of wire for whatever amperage that's pulling, then that wire is gonna heat up, it's gonna cause an overload at the box, so you can have an electrical fire um, that way um, as well. And that happens because they, you know, they just don't think about it. They want their heater over here and the cord won't stretch. And, and one of the other things for radiant space heaters and extension cords is make sure they're UL listed, which is underwriter's laboratory. And there's a little UL sign on the package or on the, you'll see them on all kinds of things, Christmas lights and all kinds of things. That at least means they meet a minimum standard and it's not just a shoddy product. You may pay a little more, but it'd be worth it. My other big piece of advice is never ever go back into a house fire once you've came out. Never ever for pets or money or whatever reason, don't go back into a, a fire. They get a few people every year that are smoking on oxygen and end up catching themselves literally on fire and passing away from it. And always have your rally point outside your house. You know, I, sometimes it sounds silly, but having knowing two ways out of your house is extremely important, especially when you wake up and your room's full of smoke. That's not a big price to pay to save your life or your family's life. Now that we're well versed in fire safety, it's time to head into the kitchen. Let's see what we've got cooking up this time. Hi, I'm Molly with West Virginia University Extension Family Nutrition Program, and today we're making sloppy garden joes. I've already washed all my fresh produce, my hands, and my cooking surfaces, so I'm ready to get started. Our ingredients for today's recipe include one yellow onion, one green pepper, one carrot that I washed, peeled, and shredded with a box grater, one pound of ground turkey, or you could use chicken, one six ounce can of mushroom pieces that has been drained, an eight ounce can of tomato sauce, a 16 ounce can of crushed tomatoes, a quarter cup of barbecue sauce, and some buns for serving. First thing I'm going to do is dice my onion. Now I'm gonna dice up my green pepper. Since we're adding this to our turkey meat, we want the pieces to all be small and manageable. The first thing we're gonna do is heat up our pot or skillet. We're gonna add our ground turkey to our bowl and our carrots. onion and green pepper. And we're gonna let the vegetables soften, the ground turkey turn brown, cook it to 165 degrees. This has been cooking for about 10 minutes. The onion are nice and translucent. The carrot and green pepper are softened and our ground turkey is nice and brown. Now we're gonna add our can of drained mushrooms, our can of tomato sauce, our can of crushed tomatoes, and our barbecue sauce. This is going to cook for 10 minutes. Let all those flavors come together and you're gonna reduce the heat and just simmer it. I'm gonna cover this and let it simmer for about 10 minutes. And then we'll check back in with it. This has simmered covered for 10 minutes and then I removed the cover and continued to simmer it for three minutes and it looks delicious. I've got my whole grain hamburger bun here. You can toast it or it could be untoasted. 
We're just gonna scoop a little bit on top. Now you could add cheese if you wanted to. And there you go, Garden Sloppy Joes. If you would like this recipe, full list of ingredients and directions, head on over to our YouTube channel or check out our webpage. Hope to see you back here again real soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of WVU Extension today. Hope to see you right back here next time.